All right, welcome and thank you for joining us, especially we're the only thing between you and, and the party, so that's really nice to come. So uh, Aaron and I will be talking about uh, SCA, meaning Software Composition Analysis for Containers. And um, that's our agenda. Um, quick words about me. So I'm, I'm the maintainer of a bunch of open source tools uh, for software composition analysis, mainly scan code and, and the about code stack. I'm also behind a few other projects, like I was one of the, the original co-founders of SPDX. I'm behind something called package URL, which you may have heard of, which is used in many vulnerability databases. And I'm also uh, working with a company called Nexby, which supports the development of these tools. Yeah, a few words about myself. Uh, at least I don't have a long list as Philippi mentioned, but I do work for Siemens Heldenius and I'm taking care of the secure development lifecycle. And in the open source space, I am a co-lead of the Eclipse Foundation Software 360 project. And I also chair the Open Chain Work Group in India. So it's, it's kind of right now inactive and we are trying to reboot it once again. So if, if anybody from India is there, this is a call for active participation in the <laughs> Open Chain India Work Group. Yeah, so a few words about uh, Eclipse Software 360. I, I have Helio here, one of our co-leads. And uh, it's a tool, it's a catalog application, kind of acts as a component central hub if you're in large organizations where you can have all the third party components listed and cataloged based on your project or a product or however way you want. So which has integrated capability for vulnerability assessments and primarily for license and compliance management and which can create legal documentation notice files and uh, <clears throat> readme documents. So. Eclipse Software 360 is currently undergoing a huge transition. We are changing uh, the front end from LifeRay to a React-based one, which would enable a lot of integration possibilities going forward, which was, that was a pain point in the past. But uh, if you're interested in this, please uh, check out our GitHub page and uh, join the community and contribute. So, yeah. So today, you know, the letter F in compliance <laughs> is for fun. And yeah. we, we, we all have a lot of fun, I guess. Anybody, I think all of you in the room would, would have experienced a certain amount of fun in the last maybe one year because things have really gotten hot in this. So everybody likes SBOM, everybody wants SBOM, but you know, Alan from CESA says the SB in SBOM does not stand for silver bullet. So I think many of you might have high hopes uh, about the session because we are doing a, you know, we are not, we have, we have solved the SCA for containers. But yeah, I'll, I'll keep your attention, you know, in holding for that. So over to Philippi to explain the context a bit more. So maybe a show of hand, uh, who is comfortable about what's a container and container image? All right, so we don't, know, we, we don't need to talk about it then, good. You, you have the slides online. Um, and how many of you are familiar with software bill of material? Show of hand. So, okay. so maybe we, we can make the session very quick, I guess. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's going to be faster. Oh, yeah. Uh, a bit more so, tricky, software. Software composition analysis. Yeah, okay, the, la the hands, so uh, again, you know, for the sake of presentation, don't raise even if you know it, okay? <laughs> the, uh, you know, this is the, the, the kind of, I would say, the uh, new oil, I would say. Earlier, it was like the data is the new oil, so now I would say like SCA is the new oil, like everyone is focused on it, and this is now currently the hot topic. Uh, predominantly, a bigger problem that everyone is trying to solve and uh, and not quite getting there. So we were also part of that journey. We would explain it in, 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 in a bit in a detail. So the primary, primary requirement or the primary reason why SCA is done is to identify the component and its associated licensing and uh, the security vulnerabilities that may come along with it. 
And the most, you know, forgotten thing is about the quality, like, because we get free stuff and we are, we go and get it. But there is a certain level of quality that we need to assure, you know, a lot of projects associated with the Linux Foundation is working on it. One of such is Chaos Project, who takes care about the health of the repository. Yeah, and right now, today, most of the companies or software organizations, you know, have, I, in my opinion, are not giving or at least started giving prime importance to this function, but uh, this is quite important and this is the key for the downstream or upstream, you know, activities associated with software engineering going forward. Okay, so little more getting into the detail, the vulnerabilities and licensing. So I, I started in, in license compliance many years back and then we were all focused on getting the licenses, license information correct at file level or maybe at higher levels. But now, even at my job, I kind of switched, not switched, I kind of converged to security. So at least my organization is seeing security and compliance as one activity or, or that comes or that has to be focused as one activity rather than separate, uh, operating in separate silos. So at least uh, from a mindset point of view, the shift has begun. Uh, it's also reflecting in the in the tooling and in the contextual setting. So we have a lot of SEA tools, both open source and proprietary out there. Most of you are aware of it. Most of you are using it. The prime importance is because of the perceived high risk, we are all focusing on security. I'm not saying we are uh, not looking into licensing, but um, compared to the security risk, license risk is still manageable, I would say, because of its static nature, whereas the security risks are quite dynamic and we need to get up to speed to be able to manage it effectively. And uh, when talking about these dependency graph, you know, right now we are, when I started compliance, like a project would have, a big project we could say is like contains, say, 100 components. So that is no more the case now. So we are now talking in terms of thousands, ten thousands, and then granularity of you know packages, and this gets really complicated. So we have uh, these SBOM standards defined by the organization. Say CISA put forwards that this is an important document we should have, and then we have all these different standards coming up. So this has not made us our life easier, and uh, the debate is still going on. What all information we should push into? the SBOM document, vulnerabilities, licensing. So it's all, all in the discussions and it is evolving. Okay, some, some, maybe it may sound a little bit controversial, but I won't take any names. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I see some, some people, <laughs> some faces changing. But yeah, a lot of, lot of expensive solutions out there, you know, with, with great marketing material, which would, uh, by reading the material itself, you would feel that we have solved the problem, but we are far from it. Yeah, large companies like enterprise companies like uh, we can afford these tools. So hence we find multiple of these tools coming from different departments, and we 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 kind of identify new tools in in some small department. And uh, so there is a challenge also to centralize and converge it into one activity, and and, and provide a quick one solution for all. And the proprietary companies, you know, they do their way of getting or making their business work by keeping some information which you may feel critical as proprietary and then giving some parts as OSS. So you are all familiar with the you know open source products that are out there which you know work with slightly complicated and restrictive licenses where the community is not getting the benefit. Okay, and this is the, the star of the occasion, like the package you are the founder, he's here. So this is like, uh, I think going forward, all the SEA tools would be in a position where they would say, do you speak, do you speak Perl? Yes, I speak Perl. Uh, okay, let's talk. So that, that's how the communication is going to be, and it, it's already well adopted. You can see a wide list of wide range of tools who are moving into the standard, and package URL is also said to be the, uh, you know, ECMA standard very shortly, right? 
Yes, we're working on standardization at ECMA. Yeah, right now it is officially part of the CVE standard for the US NVD. So it acts as a, you know, the kind of the binding agent or the glue between the supply chain tools. Okay, enough of my lecture. The problem with containers. Yeah, so the containers has made you know, software development and deployment quite easy and they, it, it at least it is perceived as you know making the developers life very easy but in effect what happened is it made the life of compliance and security people <laughs> the extra, exact opposite miserable yes and and I'm, I'm a victim of it yes so the container compliance is quite tedious uh, contrary to the belief that uh, you know at least you know people in the organization or the engineering <coughs> world feels that uh, there are a lot of tools out there, it's already solved, you know, you just, why are you not doing your job, you know, just implement it, you know, this tool says they do that, this tool says they do that and this, so why are you not doing that? So this is the question I often get in my line of work, but um, we decided to get to the bottom of it, so how? So we really wanted to take a stock of the situation and see how these claims, you know, perform when to task so we wanted to automate this SEA in containers uh, using the available tooling and uh, yeah we could not you know separate or we could not just focus on open source uh, variants or just proprietary thing so we decided let's create a project and to bring some clarity to this uh, problem that we have so hence we decided to create an SBOM clarity index so that's the project me and uh, Philippi, along with other colleagues from our organizations, collaborated to work on. And Philippi would take you through how he did it and yeah. what are the results. Yeah, so the, the idea was going in with a lot of hubris and naivete to think we would be able to, to come with a single number to qualify the clarity of information available uh, in a container. So basically, what is the list of packages that you find in a container image? And as a secondary thing, what's the license? So it's sounded very simple. And the idea was to say, we're going to select a bunch of common base image, nothing super fancy and complex. Um, collect a bunch of commercial and open source tools and uh, first establish a baseline, so making sure we would use these different tools to have a sorely vetted baseline so we knew exactly, precisely the origin license of all the packages included in all these images. And then use s bombs as a proxy to compare the inventory of uh, uh, the package as produced by different tools. So that was the, the idea going in. Uh, we thought it would be fairly easy. Um, in the end, it worked out fairly poorly. Um, for instance, we're, we're trying to figure out if package A is present in the output of two different tools. And very often tool A and tool B or tool one and tool two were not creating and reporting the same package URL, the same package identifier making it comparison difficult, even though they were potentially talking about the same thing. Um, but even before that, we had problems where uh, basic things like uh, being able to have just valid JSON for an SBOM output uh, was problematic, or uh, matching the SBOM to a schema, which is not perfect in terms of validation, but at least valid validates the syntax of, of the scheme, the, the, the SBOM was not right. So every step we had to do some small adjustment, manipulation and massaging of the data to make sure we could have something that could eventually be comparable. Um, and even when you, you had eventually schema valid SBOMs, we still had issues about the, the content structure where in some cases it's not always uh, clear uh, what to use exactly, and you end up having 
different interpretation made by different tool developers for the exact same spec, which is problematic. In some cases, we had tools reported absolutely no license information. Um, and so the idea to do an SBOM clarity index basically fall apart pretty quickly because it was not about comparing apples to apples or even apples to oranges. It's more like apples to cars. And, and that was not really easy. Um, so instead, we, we fall, fell, fell back to something a bit more uh, manual and, and not universal as a clarity index and trying to focus first and foremost on how we could align the detection of inventories between the tools and how we could uh, surface all the problems we see in these different tools and hopefully work after that with the communities and eventually reach out to the vendors to help them fix their act so, so we have fewer issues. Um, so if we think about the techniques, I don't know how familiar you are with any of these composition analyses. There's one which is very easy, which is you say you have an Alpine base image or an RPM base image or Debian base image. You're going to be able to query the system package database. In the case of Debian and Alpine, the simple text file, which has a list of all the package installed in the base image, but it may be repeated several times in each layers, and eventually you need to, to compile uh, and combine these. It's fairly easy, and pretty much all the tools are able to do that. The outcome is not 100% aligned across different tools, but that's the, the most easy stuff there. It starts to be a bit more complex when you have distro-less base image, like distro-less proper or things like Azure Linux, um, which are not using very well-defined conventions to uh, document the package database. Or there's no package database in some cases. Um, and Windows, probably very few of you have ever used Windows containers, but it's a thing, and it's useful when you deploy Windows as application. There's very little support from any open source or, or commercial tools there. Um, once you have that, you want to be able to find uh, things which are non-app package, non-system packages, which, which would be the application payload, and you may have a bunch of NPM packages, Python packages, or else. Um, and then finally, you may have binaries, so Go binary or a minified JavaScript. You want to be able to find what's in each of these for origin clues. And last but not least, making sure that you look for all the other files. Because frankly, the interesting things in terms of potential security issues and uh, licensing issues may not always be in the easy stuff because they're easy to find. They'll be vetted and reviewed by many tools at the application and system layer. But the payload you add on top, which is not coming from the base image, usually the problem where uh, the area where you may have problems. And uh, there's very few tools that do that, actually. So that's a problem. Um, there's another set of techniques beyond that, which is uh, what I call matching. So matching is you, you collect checksums or fingerprints in the files that are in the, the, the image in trying to match that against an index of known checksum fingerprints. And, and that's a way to detect the origin of files that may not otherwise be uh, uh, documented by your package database or manifest. So there's something specific there is some tools work on a squashed image, meaning they flatten all the layers if there was a single file system, which is typically what you see at runtime. Uh, or you can work layer by layer. Uh, and the layering in, in containers, if you're not familiar with, it's like a system of glass pane that are stacked on top of each other. And it's not because you're running the top layer that you may not be able to run lower layers. In all cases, uh, from a, a licensing perspective, the mere fact of redistributing code in lower layers that does not absolve you of uh, any 
compliance requirements for licenses, you're still redistributing even, even if you don't uh, uh, know or use it. There's one thing that no tool I know does today is tracing. In, in the abstract, that would be the best solution, especially if you can instrument the build, where you forget everything we want to do about kind of unbaking the cake and reverse engineering the composition of containers, but instead you say, I have a perfect forward-looking uh, understanding of what goes into my build at the time I build it. Unfortunately, we're not there, uh, but ideally that would be probably the best technique going forward in the future. So if we look about techniques for license detection, uh, you have uh, usually summary metadata available in the package database or in the package manifest which is usually a bit all over the map in terms of uh, quality and accuracy. Uh, but most, if all tools do, uh, most of all tools actually rely on that. Uh, but relying on that usually gives you pretty wrong result. Um, and it's as good as the documentation of upstream distro package is, which is usually fairly poor, depends on. Debian tends to be extremely detailed, but doesn't mean it's correct. Uh, RPM and Alpine tend to be extremely terse, doesn't mean it's correct either. Um, so that's install distro package. You have the same thing when you look at the package manifest, say for application package, say an NPM package.json or uh, a Maven Palm, these kind of things. Then the next level is to look at the actual files in the package. And could be either the files in the, in the binary that were installed in the image, or it could be files of the corresponding source code upstream that was used to build the binaries. And ju just so when I say binary, it's pretty wide because you see nowadays uh, um, bundle webpack JavaScript apps, which comprise hundreds of packages. And, and for a practical purpose, they are as complex, if not more complex, than lies than, than an stripped elf, for instance. Okay, so in terms of analysis scope, um, what we did was to look at uh, five different images. We looked a bit more than that, um, and it gives you a bit of an, an, an idea of the different layers. Not, we're not able to get actually even completion of running uh, the scan on all the different images. So it's, it's perfect. We didn't include uh, Alpine image um, just because they were generally simpler um, and there's little information on licensing in general. Doesn't mean it's, it's, uh, it's less problematic in general, just simpler. And we did exclude some tools of the parameter of the analysis just because they're, the results they were returning were just too painful to, to, for the eye and, and not worthy time. Um, so at a high level, if we look at the evaluation of the tool capabilities, and uh, we've we anonymized the, the name of the tools because again, we're not here to shame uh, open source projects or commercial tools. And if you want to have the full, it will be sanitized, but the full report, you can reach out to, to Arun and I will be welcome to share that. Uh, the, the, you, you have a bit of an evaluation of the different tool. Um, I, wish, I wish the best tool was mine, but it was not. It's actually a commercial tool at this stage. Um, and uh, uh, I think the, the ability to include matching uh, combined with other techniques was actually pretty interesting and important to getting better results. So, again, if we go into more details, we look at all the different techniques I was mentioning earlier and how each of the tools were able to, to actually use some of these techniques. In some case, we, we just reverse engineered what techniques were used by which tool just by observation of the results compared to the other tools. Uh, and, and so the, the thing is that all of them, as I said, look usually at the simple install package database. In some case, at the 
application packages, but the further down you go down the, uh, the stack, the less support there is. And, and again, I think the problem is what's the difficult part is the payload you put on top of the reasonably easier system packages in, the, in an image. So, and that's been problematic. But again, the, the difficulty here is to see the, the, the variety of coverage. One thing of interest is that a few tools were able to, to do a decent job on the binary analysis of Go packages. Um, and a lot of the container tooling is actually written in Go. Um, it happened behind the scene that we figured out that all the commercial tools and open source tools were actually using the same tool behind the scene in this case. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's a feature that's eventually not super complex to add, but it's interesting to see that there were specific uh, effort done to analyze finally the content of binaries, uh, Go binaries, and, and Go binaries in particular have a data structure called build info and another one called PCL and table, which tells you in details what are all the Go packages and there are some files installed and all the, the files built into a, a package. Yeah, so uh, after going through this painful exercise, we, we thought of, you know, identifying and then categorizing you know, what are the different types of pains we have. So first of all, is you know comparing the content is quite difficult. It's it's quite dynamic. Even though we are looking for the same thing in the stack, the results are completely dynamic and different. And the major pain point is that most of the tools are not giving a, a schema valid, you know, Cyclone DX document because we were predominantly only generating Cyclone DX format for this exercise. So the main difference was, uh, you know, we if when we run the results through a SBOM validator, it, it it fails. And the best part was, you know, the creativity around package URLs. So people went really crazy, you know, like, uh, yeah, it mandates that there should be a unique identifier, and uh, as CPs for commercial components, package URL was considered as 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 the unique identifier for that, but. Uh, they really went far ahead. They made it really unique. <laughs> and by inventing their own formats, I mean, uh, like whatever they could find, they could put it in that field so that, okay, they have a va value in that field. Okay, package URL is equal to something. And and never bother to go and check the Perl spec and, you know, verify whether that generated information is right or wrong. So that was the most, uh, you know, creative mistakes that we f found. And uh, when it comes to all the tools, there are different problems when identifying packages. So most of, you know, many of that that we found, we have been listed here, like uh, it, it went really creative, imagining things out. I think it, it went really like kind of a AI copilot kind of working. So it just imagined stuff and it just put it out. Just to make sure you understand the problem there is that if you're receiving an SBOM from a tool which has an incorrect package, list it's completely useless i mean you cannot check if there's known vulnerabilities or you will but it will say no you're fine there's no problem because the package identifiers are not known in the vulnerability database so that's 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 really serious problem yeah so among among uh, all these listed problems uh, so th this kind of you know made us stop from advancing further with with, with more insights because the bare minimum information that comes first to us itself is so corrupted and uh, people inventing PRLs renders the SBOM to be useless because when they claim or it says that okay all these say minimum elements what NTIA defined yes we are providing those minimum elements but when we check the accuracy of these actual values there is where we found a lot of problem. And the next thing was uh, in terms of license detection. Detection. So it, it was a big pain because I think many of, of, of these tools or the people behind these tools really just want to identify some license information, maybe a, a word, and if it is there, 
they feel that okay we have identified the license and some of the tools you know the point is okay we identified an MIT license so at least provide us the information from which file or what was the basis of this finding but rather giving a link to open source initiatives website for the MIT licenses is, is, is not a good practice because that's not the provenance that we want. We know it's an OSI approved license, but we don't want that link from an SBOM to say that. So the lack of uh, you know usage of SPDX license IDs was another concern because I think SPDX is there for quite some time, and you know it, it started with license IDs. So that bare minimum uh, standard is not maintained when it comes to the data quality, and which kind of renders the identified license information almost completely useless. And the other part was that, uh, you know, this whole confusion about declared license and other licenses. So most of the tools are only looking forward to finding the main license of the repository, but where the actual compliance problem lies in the other licenses that are there in the repository, which are never, or almost most of the time not identified. So uh, the learning was that, yeah, what we get from the tool, we cannot trust it completely. So we cannot completely avoid a human checking or an expert checking onto this findings, especially this license data, because yes, it is not as problematic as the security findings, but uh, it needs to be checked and validated because in this area, it is, it's very difficult for us to trust these tools. So some of these problems by the tool that we have listed is, you know, giving us invalid SBOMs, package URLs, missing packages system, you know, phantom packages, missing added files and as I said, incorrect license. So what we learned, no tool has 100% coverage and there, is, there will not be a day when there would be 100% coverage. So it's, it's, we have to uh, come to the reality where, you know, at least this part we cannot really 100% automate it. That, that day is not going to come, at least after this experience, that, that is what I can say. So uh, what we can, go is like you know to bring clarity in on the information that we received and you know validating it maybe by experts on, on certain areas would make the quality of the data quite high which would help in further processing it and uh, yeah s bombs are, are were very diverse that was not expected because uh, the question that we asked to all of these tools is the same, like what do you found in the code base? But they all gave like a very dynamic different answers. That is not what we expect out of it. So uh, we thought that, you know, one company cannot solve this problem. Maybe a community approach could help here because we, 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 kind of identify that a Sardal community, they started with an initiative where they have providing this information for base images. But I know it's, it's too much of an early stage and I think it require more muscle power to it. And especially this initiative that we did, we cannot, or, or a company, one company cannot work on it. So a community approach is, is required here. And uh, the goal of presenting this topic also to the wide community is to call for action, like, you know, join the endeavor where we need the collective information or collective experience to further, you know, clarify the areas where we are uh, having difficulty in bringing the real truth. So, yeah, so I will give away to Philippi yeah, for yeah. some recommendations. Yeah, and, and, and so the, the point here is that um, we can all collectively suffer or collectively uh, leak our wounds and, and help improve the issue. So I think, you, you should have adopt open source scanners. We find behind the scene that several of these commercial tools were actually embedding uh, in a proprietary fashion uh, open source tools, which is great. Maybe sometimes uh, without giving credit. Some tools which have a dual license, they really are two speed. Meaning you really have the open source version which has less features and the commercial license, which are more features. And that, that, that became very obvious when we ran the comparison that there was significant difference. And it's sad in a way, and it, it, 
brings back some uh, discussion that took place earlier on the supply chain security side where um, there's many tools that are open source, but the enterprise version only provide the security features. We see here in this domain that really often the enterprise version provides actually the better, uh, more accurate detection. Um, some other information, and I won't go through them in all the details, but using fewer images, uh, work with your vendors, especially if you have subscription to uh, Linux distros and are you reusing distros providing by your vendors and you pay for that, demand an SBOM and demand correctness because I know they're working on that or they're trying to, but they may not have the same concerns that you have in terms of accuracy in these, in these domains. Um, one thing you can do, and that's very practical to do on the developer level, is track what you put in images. Um, track what you add and copy when you use Dockerfile or nowadays container file or Bazel or whatever. Just make sure you, you keep track of what you add. And because it's open source, keep track of the source. You know, it's, it's a real problem to find the source after the fact. Because source code disappears and, and it's open source, so there's no, there's, it's only good to, to, to keep that. And uh, that's pretty much it there. Um, yep. So on our side, on my side, there's quite a few enhancements that, that we need to figure out to, to make the, the tools I'm maintaining better. Uh, but really the, the key, key enlightenment or key, uh, uh, Discovery was there was so much diversity across package URL, and there's really need to be work to reach out to each of the projects uh, that support package URL, reach out to the vendors to make sure we have a better compliance to the spec. Because otherwise, it makes uh, the <coughs> S bombs in general and the output of many of these tools really not amenable to automation and if there's no automation we we just can't keep up with the volume of tens of thousands of package we use in containers and which are revved up on a daily or hourly basis mm, yeah, i don't think this is it's more like a roadmap for about code, so it's less relevant. So let's go to questions. Questions? In sequence. Uh, well, it was difficult to pick up, but yes, no, no, not really. Uh, the, 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 it's really the sad thing is that if there were positive things to highlight, I would have. And I was really hoping that my tools were the, the real great best that will beat everyone. But it's not the case either. Uh, it's, it's more resulted in a list of bugs to fix. Uh, and it would have been the same for the others. CP identifiers? No, not at all. Not at all. Except for one exception, which is one of the tools was actually returning CPEs encoded in a Perl. Yeah. Which was creative, part of the creativity. And I see some people laughing, so they probably know which tool. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So the question is, how can tool 
validate that the pearls they're creating are correct. So uh, ideally, the, the, the impetus and the vision in Pearl was to say, there is no central authority and you can just observe the code and come with a magical valid Pearl. It's not the case, obviously. Um, there, there's a couple of things there. First, uh, building tools to help validate that, make them open source and making them available as a service so it's widely available. Uh, second, making a registry of all known pearls so that tools can very easily either query or an API, through an API or download a, a compact automaton with the list of all pearls and check whether it exists or not. Uh, that's one thing. And third thing, there's, there's some very clearly darker corner in the spec. And there's an effort as part of uh, uh, standardization of the spec with ECMA to also clean up these corners. Um, there's some ambiguities on how tools deal with Go package versus Go modules is one area. When should you use qualifiers or not, these kind of things, uh, which we're trying to clean up uh, as part of that. Uh, so, but in the end, so, <clears throat> data set to provide reference information, which would be easy to integrate in tools. Um, tools to actually do and do live validation and, and three uh, working to clarify the spec would be the, the three areas. And there's probably other ways, but that's the, the, the one that come to mind. Go ahead. So, so uh, that's not a tool we considered, or if we did, I will not tell you. <laughs> uh, but generally speaking, uh, uh, we didn't find any of the tools we looked at uh, that was better than the other. And they, they tend to do the fairly simple thing easily, the easy thing, mostly okay, but mostly okay. The problem is the mostly is, uh, so in general, if you are blindly relying on your tools, then you're probably doing something wrong. And that's unfortunate because I wish we would be able to do that and have some confidence in these tools, but uh, I would not put my confidence in any tool. No, um, I think the question would be like, uh, yeah, the engineering world want to automate, but uh, what automation brings, the question is wh whether it is accurate or not. Because instead of you know bringing in a lot of findings and uh, we have to spend equal effort to clean up or, or validate the false positives, then we have to ask the question like was automation beneficial? So that, that's kind of the debate that is going on and that is where we want to find a common ground where you know uh, push automation uh, at a place where there's clear a direction and where we are sure like to a certain percentage of uh, to a certain percentage where we get accurate results because that validation is what is missing right now unfortunately we don't have enough information to correlate the findings and say seal that okay this is valid yeah. crying yeah <laughs> <laughs> For one that is in view, made the tests of every single possible solution and docking and automation that we, that we better do. If some tool tells you uh, it's basically marketing, say that they do it. No tool today can do properly Docker or containers are all uh, information. This is completely lie for any distributor or even for open source people that tell you that we do everything. It's not there yet. We don't know the answer yet. We are trying to get the answer, but we don't know the answer, and no one can tell the answer yet. Yeah, so you can, you can point your management to this talk and maybe, uh, you know, get permission to join our effort saying that we don't have answers, but uh, we can join the effort in, in finding the answers. So that's the whole intention behind this presentation. Yeah. Well, one way I, I like to think about the quality of the SBOM data we got out of these efforts would be as if we were re re receiving a bunch of PDF documents 
and that you have to make sense of. It felt a bit like that. And if anyone has ever parsed the PDF document, it's pretty involved. Yeah. Yes? That's, you know, so that's like, there's this saying about watches. Uh, uh, a serious man gets two watches and a fool gets three. And if you get three, you never know what time it is. So you could, but the problem is uh, you, you cannot compound bad results with bad results. Won't get you good results. That's the issue. So eventually we should, as a community, uh, establish, publish, share, and collectively vet the ground truths for origin information and if license will come secondary but at least we have in origin we can eventually infer the license but it, there's no way uh, we can do it otherwise um, because the tools are not uh, the silver bullet to help us there unfortunately yeah so i guess time is up for us so last question before the beer no <laughs> one two three there's also non-alcoholic beverage, so don't don't feel obliged to to get uh, to get beer. So thank you, thank you so much. much. Thank you for the attention. Yeah.